Hi there. So we're going to start in Revelation 4 today, and it's completely different. I mean, we talked about the seven churches and how they represent even churches of today through the ages. Okay. In chapter after the third chapter, after the seven churches, they go into heaven. You know, they were on earth just talking before this. And the seven churches are never mentioned again. Okay. Which leads you to believe that at the rapture or the first coming, you know, would happen between him talking about it and the, and the future. Okay. And, and there's also some other interesting tidbits we'll throw in. Now, Tim LaHaye takes chapter, takes verses 1 and 2 and, and stretches it out and has all kinds of reasons for the entire rapture before the tribulation kind of thing. And I believe in pre-tribulation rapture. You know, I always have, just because we know what happens around that. You know, a lot of people think, well, it's already come, and we're going to come into the thousand years of thing, but... And he was very clear about it, even in Matthew, you know, when Jesus talked about it, that there would be seven years of tribulation, okay? After the rapture, which were taken up in spirit, you know, I believe, you know, they show all the movies where the body is just appearing in empty clothes, you know, I think we'll be taken up in spirit and our bodies will be left behind, okay? That's just my personal, because it says during the second coming, okay, that when Christ comes in the clouds, you know, first it says there will be the rapture, then there will be seven years, exactly seven years of tribulation, and then Jesus will come in the clouds and every single eye on earth will see it. Nobody will miss it. There won't be any news about it because every single person will see it. <clears throat> and they won't be able to spin that. But seven years, I mean, it's been, you know, if the rapture happened, I mean, people would have known if everybody, you know, they could put it off as a holocaust or UFOs or whatever they want to, but in any case, if the rapture had already happened, it would only be seven years, okay? And it's, you know, it's been a lot of years. I've been a Christian for 56 years, and I believe I'll be taken up in the rapture, you know, in spirit. You know, and there's been a lot of seven-year periods, and he hasn't come back yet, which leads me to believe, you know, the rapture hasn't happened yet. Because you'd know it, okay? I mean, I mean, you'd know it. You know, mainly because of the seven years and the Antichrist, you know. And, you know, the Antichrist might be alive now. I mean, there, are, there, is, there is somebody in Jerusalem that they're calling the Messiah and he's doing all kinds of miracles and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Just like Jesus said he would. Hasn't come into power yet, but, you know, we could be getting really close. But we'll go over um, what Tim LaHaye says and, and we'll go through chapter 4. You know, we'll go over there. Okay. Um, then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice that I heard spoke to me like a trumpet blast. And that was in that was Jesus spoke to him like a trumpet blast in the first chapter. The voice said, and this is important, Come up here and I'll show you what must happen after this. Like after the churches. And that's all dealt with. You know, you could have been after the rapture. Okay, and he said after this, you know, he was talking about, you know, the times will be worse than they've ever been, and you know we're getting there now. And he says, but for the sake of the elect, I will take them out first, which you know that's the rapture to save us from it. But before then, it's going to be worse than you could ever imagine, and you could see everything in the world kind of going down the tubes right now. So, I kind of lost my th train of thought there for a second. So, and it was, well, no, you know, when the rapture comes, a lot of people, I mean, they'll be able to play it off for, you know, if if we're tanked up in spirit and our bodies are left behind, they'll easily, you know, oh, they're all dead, they all died of something, you know, some, you know, chicken flu or some crazy thing like that. 
if our bodies are taken up, which I, I don't think they will. I think we'll be taken up in spirit. This is our spirits will be taken up. It says that all over. You know, it doesn't say our bodies will take up. It says in the second coming, our bodies will be taken up. The dead will rise first, you know, which could mean all of us, you know. So, but anyways, yeah. And he said, come here and I will show you what must happen after this. That's what we talked about. And instantly I was in the spirit. Okay. His body didn't go up. He was in the spirit. Okay. And I saw a throne in heaven. And someone sitting on it. Okay. And Tim LaHaye stops there and it goes on for like pages and pages and pages in his revelation, an unveiled book, about the reason that this whole thing points to the rapture before the tribulation. And he's got a lot of good arguments, and I like Tim LaHaye and, you know, everything in his book. It's just, some of this seems, you know, maybe I'm not praying enough, but some of it seems like a little bit of a stretch to me. You know? And, I mean, we can go to Tim LaHaye's book, and he, say, everything is Rapture 1 and 2, and this is the, the part we just read. Okay? 1 and 2. It says, it's no coincidence, it's the first thing to happen after Jesus has described the seven churches, which we have seen represent not only the message to each individual church, but also the seven periods of church history, which we studied. Okay. It's his being taken up into heaven. Inasmuch as John was the last remaining apostle and a member of the universal church, his elevation to heaven is a picture of the rapture of the church just before the tribulation begins. Okay. It is also noteworthy that the invitation comes from Christ himself, who was the f the one who first spoke to John like a trumpet in chapter 1. We covered that. Note how similar this event, similar to this event is the promise of our Lord to his disciples near the end of his life about taking them to his father's house. Okay, and this is John 14, 2 and 3. In my father's house are many rooms, but not so I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you also may be where I am. Okay. Everyone knows God is in heaven, and Jesus ascended to heaven, where he sits today at the right hand of God. Paul tells us when he himself when he himself died, he, his spirit and soul, would depart and be with Christ. He also said, For though I am absent for you in from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. Obviously then, Colossians two five, obviously then when when a Christian dies, his soul and spirit goes to be with Christ in the Father's house that is in heaven. Okay, that's what he says. His or her body, of course, remains in the grave until the resurrection, okay? which, for the Christian, is at the end of the church age, just before the tribulation. Okay. <clears throat> I highlighted that. Because that's, that's what I was talking about. You know, when the rapture comes, there's not going to be empty clothes. You know, like they like to, they like to movie eyes. Movie eyes, there's a word for you. You know. You know, that's why we locate the rapture at this spot in the flow of events in the book of Revelation. And, I mean, it kind of makes sense, because he's talking about one thing and he stops, and now he's saying, now let's talk about what happens next. You know, after saying that he would, you know, take the elect up, I mean, the churches he loved, the ones he didn't, said there were synagogues of Satan, and a lot of churches today fit a lot of those, you know, you can fit every one of the churches today into one of those seven churches in style. You know, no matter the the doctrine, or, you know, whatever they call themselves. And that's something, you know, we need to study. If you haven't, if you haven't really looked into the, the first three chapters in his videos, you need to do that because, you know, and I made it in seven different videos because it's good stuff and it's scary stuff too. Anyways, that's why we look at the rapture at this spot in the flow of events in the book of Revelation. There are at least four reasons for locating it here. Okay, now he gives reasons. You know, the location of this event is right for the rapture. Okay, chapters four and five represent a vision of heaven. In chapter six, it introduces the tribulation period. We haven't gotten there yet. John, one of the first true members of the Church of Jesus Christ, is a fitting symbol of the church being taken out of the world just before the tribulation begins, as our Lord promised. Okay, and this is Revelation 3:10, which we studied that. Since you kept my command, this is the Church of Philadelphia he's talking about. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test who, to test those who live on the earth. Okay. And that's, that's tribulation and second coming. 
Number two, the absence of any mention of the church in the rest of Revelation indicates that it is not that it is not on earth during the tribulation. Yeah, you know. And if, if one of his true churches were there and all this stuff going on, he would have mentioned it. <clears throat> okay. You know, there's sixteen references to the church in Revelation one through three, where chapters six through eighteen, which cover the tribulation, do not mention the church once. The church being the church as a whole. Okay, the body of Christ. Yeah. The natural conclusion drawn from this is that the church that was so prominent during the 2,000 year history, as predicted in chapters 2 and 3, is not mentioned in chapters 4 through 18 because those chapters describe the tribulation, which the church does not endure. Now, that's, that's a given. You know, the church will be taken up, you know, so they won't have to endure the tribulation. And to me, that's, that's the Antichrist, that's the mark of the beast, that's. You know, they're all talking about the mark of the beast is out now. Well, they're probably preparing for it. Hmm. But I think we'll be taken before that. Number three, the extensive use of Old Testament language and symbols in chapters 4 through 18 is an indication of Israel, not the church. Yeah, this is understandable since the church age is the time of the Gentiles, whereas the tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel determined by God for his dealings with Israel. Some of these Old Testament symbols are the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, elder, censers, cherubim, seals, trumpets, and plagues. There's much similarity, in number four, there's much similarity between the events of Revelation 4, 1, and 2 and other scriptural teachings on the rapture, such as 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. You know, none of the above four reasons is sufficient in itself. There you go. None of these four reasons is sufficient in itself to insist that Revelation 412 refers to the rapture of the church. When, however, all of them are considered together, we are inclined okay, that's a we are inclined to believe that this inference can rightly be made. Now these are prophecies that haven't happened yet, so you know if you go back and study the prophets of Isaiah talking about Jesus. And you put yourself in the mindset of of before Christ, none of it makes any sense. Okay, none of it makes any sense at all. Hindsight, when it's all happening, yeah, he fulfilled over three hundred, you know, prophecies, which are which is statistically and mathematically impossible for one person to do. So he had to be the Messiah. But like hindsight is twenty twenty. Okay. The rapture of the church is not explicitly taught in Revelation four, but definitely appears here chronologically at the end of the church age and before the tribulation. You know, We'll turn to other passages of scripture that specifically deal with the rapture so that we may cl be clearly informed of what the Bible teaches us on the subject. Okay. The first thing to occur in this vision of the future after Jesus' own revelation of the church age described in chapters 2 and 3 is the calling of John up to the Father's house in heaven. Um, did he say his father's house? You know, what we read says, you know, I saw the doors open and I saw heaven. I saw someone sitting on the throne and I was taken up there in spirit. That's what it says. Okay. And I'm not arguing. This is, this is dialogue. Okay. Vision after you saw the church of chapter two, three, da, da, da. I lost my place here. This fact has to be instructive. John obviously represents the church, and because the door opening in heaven and the personal invitation to Christ Himself is to come up here, certainly parallels other prophetic passages. You know, ergo for Thessalonians four, sixteen through eighteen. These factors all detail the rapture of the church. Most prophecy scholars are reluctant to say that Revelation four one and two are direct teaching of the rapture, because it does not specifically say so or give us any individual details about that event. Okay. Isaiah said about Jesus, by his stripes we are healed. You know, and you know, before he hung, was hung on the cross, that didn't make sense to anybody. So, however, John is a seer and is writing about future events in his day. What better way to allude to the rapture 
at this specific time, particularly since it is located right after the description of the church age and just prior to the revelation of the Antichrist, which we'll describe in the beginning of chapter 6, <clears throat> in the beginning of the tribulation. The Apostle Paul was a special writer God chose to reveal the church to the church the wonderful details of the rapture when all Christians, both dead and living, will be caught up or raptured into heaven to be with Christ. Yeah. Jesus mentioned it only once in John 14, 2-3, see above. He spoke of his second coming many times, but in every other instance, he had the, the climactic event Paul calls the glorious appearing in mind. That is usually the event most people think of when they speak of the many promises, 318 in total, in the New Testament, regarding his second, the second coming of Christ. That's not the rapture, that's the second coming. We will examine this visible phrase of his coming to deal when we get Revelation 19. Care must be taken when examining the second coming passages to determine whether they refer to the rapture or the glorious appearing. Okay. And he has a charts and you know, rapture, what does it mean? Studying the second coming of Christ in the future as they oops as they revealed to us in the prophetic books of the Bible is a perfectly legitimate subject, not only because his coming is mentioned three hundred and eighteen times, but it, it also occupied so much of the apostles. Paul's teaching ministry, the first book written to the New Testament, written in the New Testament, was First Thessalonians, addressed to a small Greek church in the city of Thessalonica. Paul was there only three weeks before he was driven out out of town by the irate Jews. While he, you know, while he was with them, he had taught that Christ would come to the rapture and Christians out of this world to go with him to his father's house. After he left, however, some of their members had died. Consequently. These young Christians were perplexed about the status of their dead Christian members, so they wrote to him a letter requesting an explanation. First Thessalonians is Paul's answer. In it, he gives the most detailed description of the rapture of the church found in all of Scripture. Note First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 carefully. Okay. I read it. This is the NIV. And this is, this is somebody else. Um, put this chart up there that he referred to and there's all the rapture passages and the second coming passages and yeah, I mean you can pause there and zoom in on that if you want but. and this is Paul talking brothers do not we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope we believe that Jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him according to the Lord's own word we tell you that we who are still alive, who are who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay? It always says the dead will be raptured first. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, you know, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And that's the second coming. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Now, Paul is alluding to that some some Christians will be left after the rapture and be taken up on the second coming. I mean, that, you know, that could mean anything. But you know, to appreciate the contrast between this event and the glorious appearing, at the end of the tribulation, we should read our Lord's own description of that event in Matthew 24, 27 through 31. And I studied this in detail in another video in one of the one of the one I prefaced revelations. Okay. You know, for as a lightning that comes from the east is visible even to the west, so it will it be the coming of Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the after the distress of those days, tribulation. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. We haven't seen that yet. Okay. At that time of the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and all, all nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of the sky in power and great glory and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from the ends of heaven. You know, from one end of heavens to the other. Yeah. You know, don't be surprised if you cannot correlate these two installments of the Lord's second coming. They are totally different. And when we include additional rapture events like those described in Corinthians 
and add glorious appearing descriptions like those we will study in Revelation 19. We can only conclude that they are not describing the same event. Yeah, that's obvious. In fact, I have discovered 15 differences between the rapture before the tribulation and the glorious appearing after it. Please examine the accompanying chart carefully. Okay. <clears throat> Now this is the rapture. I don't know if I can zoom in on this or not. Let's see. Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay. And this is the rapture one, you know, and we'll just go through these real quick. Christ comes in the air for his own. Rapture rapture slash translation of all Christians. Christians taken to the Father's house. No judgment on earth at the rapture. Okay. And he'll come like a thief in the night. You know, and and will just be gone. The church taken to heaven at the rapture. Rapture imminent could happen any moment no sign there will be no signs for the rapture okay and it's for believers only it will be a time of joy for us before the day of wrath the tribulation it'll happen no mention of Satan the judgment seat of Christ marriage of the Lamb only his own will see him and the tribulation begins okay. oh man that goes way up doesn't it okay how do we get back? Take me back to where I was. Mm -hmm. Great, now I'm stuck here. There we go. Alright, I'm going to right click again. Huh, I'm stuck here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's X. <laughs> I didn't see that X before. I can't get the X to work. Come on. There we go. Okay. And this is the second coming. <clears throat> I'm not going to zoom in on that again. That was a pain. You know. In the second coming, Christ comes with his own to earth. And we'll all be coming back with him. No one is translated. The resurrection saints do not see Father's house. Christ judges inhabitants of the earth. Christ sets up his kingdom on earth. Glorious appearing cannot occur for at least seven years after the rapture. Many signs for Christ's physical coming will be there. It affects all humanity. There will be a time of mourning immediately after tribulation. That's Matthew 24. <clears throat> Satan bound in the abyss for a thousand years. No time or place for a judgment seat. His bride descends with him. Every eye will see him. And one thousand year of kingdom of Christ begins. Okay. And a lot of people are talking about this thousand years it's coming and we're going to see it and not yet okay you know it talks about glory spring cannot come today it may shock many of my readers to learn that the second coming of christ to set up his kingdom cannot come now or anytime soon in fact the glorious appearing of christ cannot come for at least seven years yet the early church for 300 years lived almost every day in the light of his return which is why they were so successful in reaching the world for Christ. Yeah. You know, even the name millions of Christians expect Christ to return at any moment, as many rapture passages listed above teach. He will not disappoint us. He will come, and his coming could be at any moment. Yeah. But that, but that Christ is coming for his church only, which is made up of all true believers everywhere who have received him personally by faith. But to expect his return in power and majesty to take control of this earth and set up his kingdom for at least seven years is to expect the impossible. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yeah, it's two different events. Okay. And it reiterates the rapture could come at any moment. You know. Many of the texts cited above for the rapture of the church teach an imminent coming of Christ. That means he could come at any moment. Take, for example, one of the first teachings of the rapture in First Thessalonians. For they themselves report that the, this is Paul talking, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, which he raised from the dead. Jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath. Okay, and this is, goes on to stuff. Okay, and this, this whole thing's about, you know, trib and revelation, and we cover that. And then he gets into this other stuff, which we're gonna we're gonna read that, and I'm gonna play a game with you guys. Okay. Okay. So it's one or two, and then three. 
you know, we're gonna. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of the of the emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him. Twenty-four. And twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. Okay, we're going to highlight this. Each front and back. The first of these living creatures was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third was like a human face, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes inside and out. And day after day, they kept saying, Okay. Now let's play a game, okay? Now, when when Paul wrote this, okay, and there's no time heaven. There is no time in heaven. It's just it is. So when he is describing what he saw, you got to remember there was no electricity. There's no electric lights. You know, flames in the dark are easy to see as flames in the dark. He describes flames. Okay. And there were no planes. There were no helicopters. There were no flying anything. You know, okay. So, he described what he saw. And I'm going to describe something to you. You know, much like Paul would have described if he had never seen anything but animals and birds and angels. Okay. And I saw a large bird. It had six wings. It was covered with eyes. You know, there were eyes on the wings. There were eyes everywhere. Okay. And it was flying through the air. It sounded like thunder when it passed me and circled me. And the thunder was loud and it shook the heavens and it shook the pillars. Okay. Am I describing one of these creatures? Or... Am I describing this? Okay. So, could John have seen a plane, a helicopter? It's possible, you know. If you're describing something that you've never seen, you have, you have no concept of flight, you have no concept of, of electric lights, you know. These, and uh, in the dark, I mean, these the lights on these wings flash very brightly, and they... Oh, those are eyes, you know, those are eyes flashing. And there's eyes in the front, and there's, and it's covered with eyes. Okay? Big eyes. Trumpets. Loudly proclaiming. Wing, 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 wing. Okay? So, that's just a little, a little side point. You know, it's possible that he's describing something he's never seen before. And he would describe it, <clears throat> and describe it with... The kind of things he did see. I mean, it, it's a large bird, you know, and it has six wings and it has eyes all over it. So, that's just something that makes you wonder. Okay. Anyways, they were singing day after day, night after night. How long was he up there? Okay. They kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. A little side note, this, I highlighted this. Holy, holy, holy. Okay. I used to talk about this when I was a worship leader all the time. Okay. In the original language, you know, back when um, they wrote this, they didn't have words for good, better, best. Okay. You know, they, they didn't have words like, you know, supreme. You know, it was... <clears throat> If they said some, if they said something one time, holy, and it said with this other stuff. I mean, Jesus used to talk, you know, and it's in the King James. You know, they use the word verily, you know, verily I say unto you. If he says it one time, he says, listen to this. And if he says it twice, verily, verily, it means this is important. This is really important. You have gotta listen. If he says it three times. That is the utmost importance, okay? In the original scripture, when they used anything three times, that could only be describing God himself. It was the only thing they were allowed to use three 
things, you know, three expletives, holy, 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 verily, 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 the, they could only use that. So all they were allowed to say to describe anything on earth was two, holy, holy, verily, verily. This is really important. This is really, really important. This is really, really, really important. You know, today, you know, we've turned that into good, better, best, or good, magnificent, or supreme, you know, we would consider holy, holy, holy. The closest thing to us is supreme. And to tell how far the earth has gone down, they use supreme now to describe burritos. Back then, they weren't allowed to describe anything as supreme unless they were talking about God himself. It makes you wonder, huh? And, that, and that's why a lot of our, our verses, when we talk about God, we sing, holy, holy, holy. You know, one of my favorite ones, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. And you're talking about God when you say something three times. So remember that next time you throw around the word supreme. You know, the rules have changed, but the truth has not. <clears throat> anyway, that was interesting. Okay. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. There are a lot of songs around this, huh? For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Okay. Now that's chapter four, and you know we're gonna we're gonna stop. There's a lot in there, okay. And as we continue on, it'll get it'll get more into the into the rapture and and the tribulation, okay. And okay, the next chapter talks about you know opening the scroll and nobody can open it except Jesus. So until then, I hope you're enlightened. I'm in. You can ask me questions, and I'll answer them the best I can, you know. You know, special thanks to Tim LaHaye and Revelation Unveiled, I mean, Zondervan Publishing. Um, I wasn't allowed to, you know, I tried to get a cop, you know, them to release it to me, to use it in studies, and churches and stuff can do it, but single people can't, so and they just said, you know, we don't do that, so... I just show you scriptures. I bought the book. I bought the Kindle edition, so I own the book, and I make references to it, and I use it in all the links and stuff are in there, so I'm doing my due diligence. But, till next time, it's getting good now. We're talking about what's going to happen. Hopefully, after we're taken up, you know, will we get to watch this for seven years? I kind of hope not, you know. I hope we just enjoy being with Jesus and all of a sudden, come on, it's time to go back. And I go, oh, it's time to go back. Okay, let's go. You know, that'll be fun. But until next time, we're getting excited. Keep reading, keep praying, keep believing. Study the Church of Philadelphia because that's what you want to be like. See you next time.